Okay. So let's get started with our last talk, um, uh, which is Edward Mashari from um, University of Pittsburgh, professor of uh, history and philosophy of science. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Good. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, it's really a difficult position because I'm between you and your dinner. <laughs> Maybe even worse, you and your drink. So, uh, so that's not really that good. And I only have 95 slides. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of slides between you and your dinner. But, uh, the good news is that it's to, to a large extent it's going to uh, repeat what we've seen before, but in different ways. So in, in a sense, I, I'm. I'm a strong believer in repetition. I'm a strong believer in saying the same things again and again, but in many different ways. <laughs> um, so, um, that's good. All right. Um, so here's the kind of stuff I want to talk about, conceptual issues. I'll go very quickly through that, because uh, you know, we started by these kind of questions this morning. Simin started to talk about that. And I said a few words about scale. So again, I can go very quickly, because what Josh said, in a sense, covers some extent the issue of scale. Uh, then I say a few things about descriptive statistics and about the importance of looking at data. You know, so when you do experiments, the first thing you want to do before doing any inference is just look at your data. I think it's really important. And uh, sometimes people just don't spend enough time doing that. There's actually very well-known cases in psychology where just if people had looked at data, mistakes could have been avoided. I could give you examples if, you, if you're interested. Then uh, we look at the various kinds of tests. Again, it's going to repeat in many ways the kind of things that Josh was talking about earlier, and the kind of things we heard also this morning in Virginia's talk. Then we look at the most important tests, partly also done already, but we, we look also at ANOVA, which uh, Josh didn't say anything about. And then uh, very, uh, a few things about advanced uh, topics, which bears on some of the things we've heard also today. So conceptual issues. So I, I'll just really just go to the crucial point. So what you're trying to do in statistics is you, you want to make a claim, you want to make an inference about a population, which is an infinite set of data from a sample. And a sample are a finite set of data which is drawn from this infinite set of, 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 of data. So your job is to say something about this collection of data from really a finite amount of of, of data. To do that, so that's a sample, it's a set of scores that is drawn from a given population on a given occasion. And to do that, your job, you compute what is known as a statistic, right? So that's statistics. We, we already defined what a statistic. A statistic just is a function of the data, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, a mean is a statistic, a median is a statistic, a mode is a statistic. More complex statistics, the one you've been just looking at, the t is a statistic. The chi square is also a statistic, but that's just function of the data, right? So you can actually uh, you can just define them mathematically. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. Now, an important notion, which um, uh, uh, which we'll come back a little bit later when we look at some of the statistics, is the notion of a sampling distribution. So a sampling distribution is a distribution of a statistic, right? For example, a mean, right, of a repeated sampling. Of a sample size, of a, of a sample of a given size. So let's imagine that you are you have a sample of ten subjects, right? And let's imagine that the statistics you're interested in is a mean, right, or the average of your population. A sampling distribution is if you were to, to to sample again and again and again, if you were to sample infinitely, right? What would the distribution of means of your sample look like? conditional on some hypothesis. Right. I will give you an example. Uh, so the sampling distribution of the mean is a distribution of the sample means of a repeated sampling of a sample of size n from a population. And its standard deviation is called a standard error. So maybe it's a little bit abstract, so let me just give you uh, an example. So let's suppose, um, um, let's suppose that uh, you uh, want you are sampling from a population whose true mean is 50, right? Uh, it's, it's an infinite population, but each of your sample has five, five individuals. What you have here is the distribution of the means of your samples, right? For the most common means you're going to get, its, it's value is going to be identical to the true mean of the population. But sometimes, right, the mean of the sample is going to be larger 
than the true mean of the population. Sometimes it's going to be lower than the true mean of the population. Right? And that curve here is just a sampling distribution. It describes how a statistic is distributed over repeated sampling given a sample of a particular size. It's a very simple notion. Um, all right. So that's, that's a notion we, that we, you need to keep in mind. We'll come back to that a little bit earlier, a little bit later. All right, I'll skip that. We've talked a little bit about that. The p-value, let me repeat one more time. I think I'm not sure we, we've heard it enough. <laughs> it's the point of getting a statistic of a given size or a larger one if the null hypothesis is true. So, um, and what you do when you do null hypothesis testing, that's a most common way of drawing an inference nowadays in the census is you want to conclude that, for example, the mean of a population is different from zero. Or you want to conclude that the means from two populations are different from one another. Or you want to conclude that two variables, they are related to one another to an extent different from zero. Right? They are to some extent related, related to one another. How do you do that? Well, the idea is the way to do it is not to look directly at the hypothesis, but you knock down another hypothesis. You knock down the null. And the way to knock down the null, the way to show that, the way to reject the null is to say, look, the data I have now would be incredibly unlikely if the null would be true. If you can show that the data you have, or more extreme data, would be, would be unlikely if the null is true, you conclude, you infer that the null is, you reject the null. And because you reject the null, you can embrace the hypothesis you're really interested in, the alternative hypothesis. It's kind of a random, it's kind of a weird way to test hypotheses. Right? What you really want to show is that a hypothesis that a po the mean of a population is different from zero, or that two populations have different means. But you don't do that directly. What you do, you reject the hypothesis that the populations have the same means, or you reject the hypothesis that the mean of a population is equal to zero. And once you've done that, you can embrace the hypothesis you really interested in. Now, there are reasons why you do it that way. If you're interested, I can just explain it to you. But what I really want to, what I really want to see is that it's kind of a weird way about drawing an inference, right? It's really kind of counterintuitive about um, what you're interested in is hypothesis H. And the way you embrace hypothesis H is by rejecting another hypothesis, right? Um, and you're rejecting on the ground that the data you have obtained, a more extreme data, would be unlikely if the null hypothesis were true. So we've seen all that. OK, I, I can skip that. All right. Now, the test. I think it's very similar to the test you gave earlier, actually. But you know, I think it's worth doing it <laughs> another time to be sure that everybody understands what a p-value is. Um, and I'll show you data after showing that psychologists usually don't understand what they're talking about when they talk about p-values. Um, it's really quite sad. Uh, let's suppose you've got uh, <laughs> two, uh, well, it's not very difficult, <laughs> and the data are really quite striking. Uh, that's the next slide. Uh, so you've got a psychologist, John Lucky, he's writing his PhD, and um, he's comparing two groups. They have the same, they have the same sample size, the total sample size 40. Each of them is 20, and he, uh, following Josh, what should you do? A t-test. Right, because you're combining two independent groups. And good luck, the p-value is when it's called John Lucky, his p-value is equal to 0 0.01. He rejects the null hypothesis, right? And he embraces the hypothesis. He concludes that the two populations have a different mean. Now, what did he show? That's the question. What did it really show? You have here six statements. For each of them, you have to say whether it's correct or not. You have absolute John, John Lucky has absolutely disproved H0. I give you a hint. No. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, he hasn't disproved anything. We're not doing uh, you know, logic. We're doing statistics anyway. <laughs> so you don't prove or disprove anything. You have found the probability of the null hypothesis. No. But why? No, the answer is no. You haven't found the probability of the, of the null hypothesis. You found the probability of the data, or more extreme data, conditional on the null hypothesis being true. Of course, that's different from the probability of the hypothesis, even conditional on the data, right? Um, is there a board somewhere here? 
Well, there's a board below it, but we need to know how to, uh, to go up. Uh, yeah, I don't have to do it. Well, I, I can write it here, actually. Yeah. Um, so what you have is not exactly true, because that's not exactly what you have. So that's a uh, point of the data condition on the null. That's not what the p-value is exactly. But just bear with me for a minute. Uh, the question would be, even that the probability of the null hypothesis conditional on the data. I tell you, oh, should I believe in the null hypothesis or not? Well, these two things are obviously quite different if anybody has taken you know, the philosophy of science, you know, Bayes' theorem, it tells us how to move from here to here. But you can't infer that value from this value if you don't know the prior probability of the null hypothesis, right? So if you don't have that, pro that probability, you can't, you can't infer anything about whether the null is likely or not from your data. So that's, that's false. You have absolutely proved your experimental hypothesis, <laughs> obviously not. You can deduce the probability of the experimental hypothesis being true. No, it's okay. And why? Exactly. I mean, again, what you just have, the probability of the data conditional, or data work stream data conditional on the null, to, to turn that into a posterior probability, probability of the null hypothesis or probability of the, of the uh, alternative hypothesis, you need to know the prior probability. And of course, the whole point of classical statistics is not to worry about prior probabilities. Right? So, no, you can't do that. So you do an experiment, you're rejecting the null. Don't believe that you, have, you are justified in saying the probability of the null given my data is really low. You're not justified in saying that. Not at all. You're not say, justified in saying the probability of my alternative hypothesis conditional on the data is high. You're not justified in saying that. That's, to, to, to draw this conclusion, you would need to know the prior probability. And you don't know them. And in fact, the reason why you're doing classical statistics is because you're skeptical even of that notion of prior probability, right? Otherwise, you would do Bayesian statistics. All right. Uh, you know, if you decided to reject the null hypothesis, the probability is that you are making the wrong decision. Yes, no? No, that, again, for the same reason, right? What you have here is a posterior probability, right? Um, and you have a reliable finding in the sense that if the experiments were repeated a great number of times, you would obtain a significant result of 99% of the equation. True, false? No, that's false again. So all these statements are false. All these statements are misunderstandings of what a p-value is. A p-value just tells you the probability of the data or more extreme data conditional on the null hypothesis is blah, blah, blah. Nothing more, nothing less. You can't infer anything about whether or not you, the, the null hypothesis is likely or not. You can't infer that. You can't infer anything whether or not the alternative hypothesis, your hypothesis, is likely or not. You can't do that. <coughs> now, the interesting fact, as I said, is that when you ask psychologists, at least in the 1980s, hopefully it's better now, a professional psychologist, actually, or maybe graduate students, I don't remember, is what you can see is people who agree with that statement among psychologists, uh, the one with proof and absolutely is proof, nobody was taken by it. But the other one, you can see the number, uh, num number five, more than 80% of psychologists uh, misunderstand the question and, and agree that, uh, that what it means, the same is true for number four, the same is true for number six. What it shows is a deeply rooted misunderstanding of what p-value is, and I hope that today by just repeating like dozens of times, <laughs> <laughs> You know, we all understood what a p-value really is, right? And I think it's really important to just keep in mind, a p-value does not, when you have a very low p-value, you should not draw the conclusion that your null hypothesis is unlikely, or that, your, uh, or that the alternative hypothesis is likely, right? So it's just that, that's an inference that you're not allowed to do. What you can do is you can reject the null based on, based, based on your data. That's that, that you can do. All right, that's just the conceptual issues. Now, uh, scales, so that kind of reflect a little bit what we've been talking about. There are four types of scales. <laughs> uh, the first type is nominal scale, which is just distinguish distinction of objects into classes, right, which are just usually coded by numbers, um, gender, male and female, right, just a, uh, just a uh, nominal scale. 
there's an ordinal scale where you, uh, the objects are distinguished from one another, um, and there's some, some kind of ordering among the objects. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Right? Um, like just ranking is a good example of an ordinal scale. Right? There's a top department, there's a second department, there's a third department, but there's no assumption that the difference between the first and the second is equal to the difference between the second and the third. Or the difference between the, 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 the second and the fourth department is equal to, to the difference between the fourth and the sixth department. Right? You just have some kind of ranking, but the differences just are not meaningful. Right? Um, so that's an ordinal scale. Um, interval scales are scales on which equal intervals represent equal differences. Right? So for example, temperature in Fahrenheit, right, uh, the difference between 80 and 90 is equal to the difference between 100 and 110. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's the same difference here in both, in both cases. But the ratios are not meaningful. Right? So the difference between 10 and 20, the ratio of 10, 10, uh, 20 to 10 is not identical to the ratio of 50 to, uh, 100 to 50. That's not the same. That's not the same ratio. Actually, the ratios are actually there's no ratios are not defined over an interval scale. Right? Uh, differences are most of the um, uh, most of the scales which are used in statistics, except for the indeed uh, statistics fascists, uh, are are interval scale. Right? So the uh, Likert scale or Likert scale? I don't know exactly how you say it properly. Uh, People disagree. Okay, Likert. Um, <laughs> If you disagree, I can just decide. Uh, so, so like a scale, are treated usually as interval scale. Right? And then you've got the ordinal scale, which in psychology uh, are incredibly rare, maybe even inexistent, I don't know. I don't know whether anybody has an example of an ordinal scale, for which you have a true zero, right? um, where zero is actually meaningful. Uh, if you have a true zero, then the ratios are actually genuine. Right? So if you compare, for example, lens, lens has a true zero, as there's such a thing as, a, as something that has no lens. So uh, as a ratio, uh, are meaningful, right? Uh, something which me measure one meter, something which measure half a, half a meter, the first one is twice as big as the second one, well, 50 to 25 to have exactly the same ratio. So ratios are meaningful when you have a genuine zero. Most scales in psychologists are interval scales, as I said, but of course you do have uh, uh, nominal variables, right? As, as we've seen, as we've seen a little bit earlier. All right, I'll skip. and the same is true of experimental philosophy. Now, it's very important to choose your scale properly. Uh, um, you know, it's, uh, and it's one question is that: Is it more meaningful to get data on an interval scale or on an ordinal or nominal scale? Right? Well, and there's no one answer. It depends on your research question, right? So, for some question, what you want to be asking is. Uh, a question on the uh, ordinal scale. So, for example, if you work on the Gettier case, if you're an example philosopher, philosopher, you want to know whether someone in the Gettier case knows or really knows that P, or just failed to know that P, well, here, here it would seem that an ordinal, question, an ordinal scale is, is the right question, right? It's a no or fail to know, right? There's no middle ground, it strikes me, you know? It's not like you know and then you move a little bit away from, know, from knowing and then suddenly you fail to know. Uh, it's, it's a weird way of thinking uh, about uh, the relation between knowing and, and, and failing to know. Um, so maybe for getting a case, using an ordinal, an ordinal scale is actually more meaningful than using an interval scale. On the other hand, a common trick is to give people a statement, right? John knows that, the, that uh, uh, or John does not know that it's 2 p.m. in the clock case. Right, in the get here case, and then ask people whether they agree with the statement. Right? And then an agreement, indeed, you can have a proper interval scale. Right? So, but that depends on your research question. Why is that important? Because as we've seen earlier in, uh, Josh, during Josh's presentation, data analysis, what tests you're going to run, depends on, on the measurement scale. So if you're using a categorical scale, as we've seen, you need to use a chi-square test. If you're using interval scale, you need to use parametric tests like t-test, I'll come back to what that means, ANOVA or correlation. And if you're using an ordinal scale, you need to use a class of statistical tests, which we haven't talked about, uh, which are called non-parametric non -parametric tests. Um, and that's a different class of statistics, uh, which is also found on SPSS. So you know, if you have SPSS, you can run this test. There are counterparts of the usual. So what you have is for each of the usual tests, you have the counterparts, which are defined over uh, 
ordinal, of a, of a ordinal scales. But the key idea here is that when you've got these four scales, it's really important to, to think a little bit about your research question, you see which scale fits best your research question. Then uh, your data analysis is going to depend on the scale you've been using. And here's a very simple summary, uh, chi-squared test, interval scale, and uh, 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 ordinal scale. All right, so statistics has two parts. It has a descriptive part, it has an inferential part, right? So we've been focusing mostly on the inferential bit of statistics, where you start from a, from a sample and you want to make a claim about the population. But part of statistics is just descriptive. And uh, you know, I think some of the great statisticians, like Tukey, for example, have really highlighted the importance of having good ways of describing the data one, one has, right? Uh, and there are many ways of describing the data uh, you have before drawing any inference about the population. So descriptive statistics is just about describing the sample, right? It's not about making any conclusion about the population. Uh, and you have two types of measure. You've got the measure of central tendency, which tells you uh, 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 where the center of your data lie, lies. And you've got many ways of thinking about the center. You can think about the mode, which is the most occurring score, the so median, that's the score which separates 50% of data points from the other 50% of data points. And you can think about the mean, right? You should just add the data points and you divide by the number of, um, of data points. Now, they have different virtues and vices. The mode and the median are really nice because they're defined over ordinal and categorical scales, right? The median, the mean, is not defined over ordinal and categorical scale. These ones, these ones are. The, uh, uh, the mean, of course, if you want to run parametric statistics like t-test, ANOVAS, they're all, they're, all about, they're all about the mean. Right? There are also others, there are also a bunch of other, that's a class, that's the simplest measure. There are also a bunch of other measures of central tendency, which in a sense describe the center of your data point. There's three means, there's a bunch of other measures, but that's only the only one you need to know. <coughs> But it's not enough to know the central tendency. What you also want to have a sense is the dispersion of, of your data. And the sample variance, which is computed uh, that way, that's the mean, you subtract each data point uh, from the mean, you square, and you divide by n minus 1 for the sample variance. Right? Um, it gives you a sense of how widespread, how distributed your data, your data are. So it's important, in a sense, when you look at your data, to have a sense of where the center is and how widespread around the center the data, the data are, right? How dispersed around the center. So variance tells you um, uh, uh, an, index, an index of that. Now, uh, an important thing also is the notion of an outlier that was mentioned in Simin's talk this morning. Sometimes, uh, you know, you, you're going to collect your data and it's all going nicely to, to be distributed in something that vaguely looks like a normal distribution. And then you're going to have these individuals as outliers. Uh, uh, something here, you can have a nice correlation here between your two variables. And then there's this individual here, which is kind of screwing your correlation or just really transforming it massively. Right? It's important when uh, it's important to pay attention to outliers, and we'll come back to that in a minute. All right. So the first thing, to, so that's for discrete statistics. Now, the first thing to do when you do an experiment is look at the data. Really. Uh, Look at the data, look at the data, look at the data. And looking at the data is important in many ways. You want to compute descriptive statistics for the samples. That's what, you know, I've reviewed just some of them. Uh, you want to plot the distribution of the scores. Right? And I will really show you two ways of plotting the distribution of the scores. You want to identify the outliers and you want to deal with them. It's also going to be very important because looking at the distribution of scores, of scores allow you to see, at least roughly, whether the assumptions of your statistical tests are met. As we will see, every statistical test, the one you've been running, t-test, uh, chi-square, and uh, uh, which one? And, uh, um, correlation. Correlation, right? All are making assumptions about the populations from which the data are drawn. If these assumptions are not met, if they're false, the p-value you are reporting are widely misleading. And you're saying, oh, my p-value is 0 0.01. Well, under some conditions, that's just not going to be true. Right? If, if the assumptions are, are violated, that's just not going to be true. Looking at your data gives you, there are formal ways of testing whether the assumptions are met, but looking at your data just gives you a sense whether they are likely to be violated or not. Right? Um, all right. So 
Here are two different ways to represent your data. You can use a histogram, I think we, we saw one this morning. So for example, uh, you know, here what you have is a, is a Likert scale, and su subject will ask a question. Actually, what was that? Um, oh, it's, uh, it's true temp. You know, for those who do epistemology, right, the guy has a, has a brain accident, and he can just detect, detect whether it's hot or cold outside, perfectly reliably, and that's the answer on a true temp case. Right? Uh, uh, and I think it was an argumentation whether he knows or, or does not know. Right? So that's the proportion, or the frequency, not the proportion, the frequency of various answers for each of the seven points of the Likert scale. It's a nice way to just look at the data. What you really see is, well, it's kind of a you know, that's a uniform distribution, really. Just, just looking at the data, you see people just so I'm kind of answering a bit randomly here on that question because there's no real trend, there's a slight trend toward knowing, but it's really a slight trend. Another way of representing your data is called a box plot, which has this uh, shape here. So a box plot, um, <coughs> which I really like, plots a and SPSS does it for you. It's not like you have to uh, do it by your, by your hand. Uh, you have your median here, which tells you where half of the data, the point at which half of the data lie, uh, your median here. You have the upper quartile and the lower quartile. So 50% of, of your data are in the box. 25% are above, 25% are, are below, and 50% are here. And you have here uh, what is known as a whisker, which takes that value, multiply it by uh, uh, 1.5, and add it to that number and to that number. Right? So in a sense, it, it gives you a sense of what the data looks like. So what, what you look here, so these cases are a true temp, the second one is a zebra case, like a Dresky case, right? And the third one is a fake band case, Al, Al Goldman's case. Uh, what you get here are, um, well, for the uh, true time case, half of the subjects are between three and six. For the zebra case, half of the subjects are between four and seven. And the same is also true for the, um, for the, um, the third case, what, what Barn. Fake bar, exactly, a fake bar case, right? And you also get a, a sense of the median. So it gives you roughly a sense of, of what the distribution looks like. It's really, it's really, co co it's really quite important to, to, in a sense, look at your data. So there's a very famous case in the history of psychology um, where people just, if they had looked at their data, they would have avoided a terrible mistake. Uh, and I think it's, it's really quite well known, but I'm not sure you guys know it. So how do rats learn to navigate maze? Very interesting question. Uh, psychologists have been working on that for really quite some time. Well, here are two hypotheses. Um, um, it's a curve. You know, they, they learn slowly. You, know, you put them, you, you put them here. Here's another hypothesis. It's a step function, right? You know, they don't get it, they don't get it. Ah, they've got an insight. And once they've got the insight, they're always learning. So really, two different ways of learning. Here's that insightful learning, as we may say. Here, you know, it's kind of a reinforcement learning. So you know, you you need to have a lot of feedback until until you learn it. Now, let's suppose you got a bunch of rats, and let's suppose that they're all very insightful. So they're insightful, insightful creatures. But the point at which they are insightful. So they're not insightful at the same time. Right? So some are really insightful very quickly, others are insightful a little bit more slowly. Now, let's suppose you aggregate a cross, well, I think it should be more like that, but let's suppose, let's suppose you aggregate across all the rats, then when you're going to aggregate, you're going to have the impression that learning how to navigate a maze is a matter of slow, uh, slow improvement, which fits very well with you know, stimulus response learning. If you look at each data point, if you look at your data, rather, what you get is for each, for each subject you have, uh, you have an insightful, insightful learning. Uh, it's a well-documented case like, uh, in, in, in psychology. Uh, the data looks like that. People have concluded that this is a curve for, for learning. So it's really important to look at, at, at the way your data, look, your data look like. So when you've got outlier, what to do with them? Well, the first thing you should do is, with outlier is just check what well recorded. Uh, yeah. Um, if I, mean, I, I guess Simi would not be the right person because she's got research assistant. Tons of them who code her data, <laughs> and, and now, nowadays anyway, it's done on, the, on Amazon Turks, done on the web. So really, it's for many studies. You don't have to do it by hand. But a few years ago, 
you know, data were really recorded by, by hand. You had paper surveys, which you had in a sense to enter the number in your Excel file, which I guess some people still have to do. It's very easy to make a mistake. So if you got an outlier, the first thing to do is to go back to your coding and check whether or not you have made a mistake. If, it, if you didn't make a mistake, if it was well recorded, then you need to decide whether to keep uh, that data point in your sample. It's really quite a tricky business. Uh, there's no, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a part of statistics which is dedicated to what to do with outlier. I don't know it very well. Uh, um, but you may, ha you may have good reason for excluding it from your sample. So if you're doing it in reaction times, you clearly want to, to exclude extreme reaction times from, you know, from your data set. You want to do it, as Simon said this morning, you don't want, want to do it on an ad hoc basis. You want to have rules that you set before doing it. And the most important point is that you want to say it. I, I think it's, you know, it's, statistics is an art as much as a science. You know, there's a lot of things we do, we have rules of thumb, uh, but we want to be honest about what we want to be honest about what we are doing. Another strategy that expert philosophers and psychologists, at least social psychologists, are not often using, is to transfer transform your data. So if you know if your data are uh, uh, by transforming your data, for example, by taking the logarithm, the logarithm of your data, you can turn data which are not normally distributed into data which are normally distributed. Uh, so that's a strategy you can use, right? Instead of running your statistics on the data you have, run the statistics on the logarithm of your data. If you do that, for example, the outliers are going to disappear, right? Uh, so that's one thing you that, that's one thing you can do. It's a common practice in uh, my common, commonly uh, it's commonly commonly recommended by by statisticians. So outliers check that they're right. If they are right, if they're well recorded, decide whether or not to keep them. You know, to be honest about it. Or if you, know, if you want to keep them here as a bunch of alternatives, transform the data. Instead of using a parametric test, use a non-parametric test. If you've got outliers, if you're keeping them, very likely some of the assumptions of parametric tests, like t-test, ANOVA, reg uh, regression, are not going to be met. It's not the end of the world. You can use a non-parametric test to test uh, your hypothesis. That's something else. Uh, so, and my view is that it's often really useful to analyze data with and without outliers. You know, what you really want to show is whether your data analysis is robust. Right? You really want to show often that you will get the same analysis if you had left the outliers in. Now, that's not always going to be the case. Right? Sometimes you know, keeping the outliers will change your, your, your outcome of analysis. But if you can show that it doesn't really matter whether they're in it, then uh, um, you know, showing that making different ways of analyzing the data gives you the same conclusion is actually, uh, I think, something that has to be recommended. It's just like when you're modeling a phenomenon, right? Uh, having many models of the same thing, showing that uh, 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 your, your modeling is actually robust, is quite similar. That's quite, quite, quite a similar idea here. All right, so the, look at the data. Just focus on the sample before trying to do an inference. But once you've described the sample, the properties of your data, you want to try to make a conclusion about the population from which the data are drawn. And as we've seen already, there are two types of tests. There are tests that focus on showing that various populations have different means. Right? The tests of difference. So t-test, right? your goal is to show that two populations have different means. ANOVA, uh, 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 so analysis of variance, is also to show that various populations have different means. Right? But you have tests of association, which want, to, which want to show, as we've seen earlier, that when you change one variable, there is a change that takes place in another variable. So it's two different types of, of tests. And again, which test you need to run depends to a large extent on what questions you're interested in. Right? So uh, your research project determines, in a sense, the kind of statistics you need, you need, you need to run. So uh, speaking of it, a very bad idea is collect data and then think about the stats. So that's just not the right way to, to go about designing an experiment. The right way to go about designing an experiment, have a research project, and from the get-go, think about the way you're going to analyze your data once you have, once you have, once you have your data. So you know, the data analysis should very, very early on be built in the development of your research, development of your research project. If anybody is hang, uh, hanging out sometimes with people who do um, uh, um, uh, research in the biomedical sciences. So that should be obvious because you can't have any project in the biomedical sciences without having a statistician involved very early on in the design of the experiment. Right? So in, in, of course, 
So kind of statistics we do are much simpler, so we don't need to have someone with a PhD in statistics to help us design the experiment. But it's still the case that uh, thinking very early on about what kind of data you're going, what kind of analysis you're going to run is really important. I've seen experimental philosophers in the early days of experimental philosophy, I won't give any name, uh, uh, you know, people I really admire, uh, uh, collect data, literally, I mean, huge amount of data and just wonder, well, how am I going to analyze this data? And you know, the papers were never published because just people didn't know how to how to deal with uh, with a huge amount of data they had collected in thousands of uh, thousands, dozens of variables and, and that kind of things. Um, so if you start with uh, uh, a clear research project and you think about how you're going to analyze your data, it's going to be much easier. Now you can have oops. Some uh, uh, some tests are going to be you're you're, uh, uh, you're going to have two types of tests when the samples are independent and when the samples are related, right? So that's related to the between subjects and the within subject design. It's not exactly the same. So uh, samples are independent when the score within a sample are probabilistically independent from the score within the other sample. So if you randomize subjects in two conditions. The scores are obviously independent from one another, right? We don't believe in ESP, we don't believe in that kind of things, in cosmic luck. So, uh, so if people are ascribed to one condition to another, independent sample, between subject design, usually. But in some conditions, the samples are not going to be independent, right? So the data points in one sample are going to be somehow related to the data point in another sample. That can happen in many different ways. It could be a within subject design, where the same individual is asked again and again and again to do, uh, the same individual is, is um, uh, the same participants are involved uh, uh, across all conditions, right? So you kind of, let me give you an example to make that clear. Trade post, you want to know whether a diet is useful, right? Well, one way to go about doing that is uh, uh, have people before the diet, I mean, you want a control group, but forget about the control group for a minute. Uh, uh, you want people before the diet, you measure their weight, and after the diet, right, you, you, put, them, so you, you, you put them on diet, and then you measure, you measure their weight after the diet. Here the same participants are going to be involved before the diet and after the diet, in the two conditions. It's called a within subject design. But that's not the only form of within subject design. If you take siblings, for example, sim, uh, 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 brothers, right, and you take, you take, you take uh, a group of two brothers, right? And you take one in one condition, the other one in the other condition. Well, what you have is related samples, just because it's likely that brothers are going to, an, to, to answer right, roughly the same way to many things, to, by virtue of education, genetics, and what have you, right? So there are many ways in which uh, the, the data points in two different samples can be related to one another. Within subject design is the most common ways, but you've got other ways, other ways as well. Now, which type of statistics you're going to use depends on whether your samples are independent from one another, right? The data points in one sample do not influence the data points in another one, or whether the related <coughs> data points in one sample have an influence or correlate somehow to the data point in the other sample. Different statistics, different tests, so different tests are going to be used in uh, these two conditions. Now, which one should, we, should you use? Should you do independent samples or dependent samples? To simplify, should you do between subject design, you assign subjects randomly to two conditions, or within subject design, you take the same subjects and you uh, ask them to first do condition one and then condition two, or maybe the order is, is randomized. Well, both have virtues and both have costs. So independent samples have a, has a smaller power. Right? So the probability uh, test with test with independent samples, they have a smaller power. So the probability to detect a true effect is lower when you have used different subjects, different participants in the different conditions. Of course, you want, you want studies with high power for the reasons we talked about this morning. Um, on the other hand, well, you have no other effect, right? Um, you know, obviously, because subjects are only exposed to one condition. Right? So that's good, that's simpler. And also, it's likely that subjects are more likely to be blind to the point of the study, right? When you put subjects uh, in the various conditions, well, subjects are, may well get an understanding of what you're really trying to do. I mean, if you show them all the, uh, all the conditions, they may just understand, oh, you want me to say that in that condition, people are more likely to blah, blah, blah than in this condition, right? 
Um, within, within subject design, when you've got a larger power, so you need fewer subjects, which is often good, depending on what kind of experiments you're doing. Uh, but on the other hand, there are other effects that you need to control for, right? uh, depending on which condition you, you, you see first. It may have an impact on your answer on the following condition. And also, uh, 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 subjects may well be guessing the point, uh, the point, the point of the study. Right? I mean, so in some cases, within subject design, are really quite transparent. I mean, you really see what the point of the experiment is. Um, you know, I could give some example of my own work where you, we use both uh, within and between subject design. But in the within subject design, it was pretty clear what we wanted subject to do, and they did it actually. So we, we, are, we actually were quite grateful. They gave us the results we <laughs> we expected from them. But we did we did replicate the experiment in the between subject design. So we, we were we were quite happy about that. Um, all right. So what you get is a bunch of different kind of circumstances. So you can be interested in association. There's the differences. Your samples can be independent or they can be related, right? And um, 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 yeah, and so what you get, uh, and then you get different types of scale, right? Type of data. What you get here is a complex organization of all the tests you may use depending on the situation you're, you're in, right? So, for example, if your data are categorical, if you've got an ordinal scale, right? Uh, and if you've got two categorical variables, as we've seen earlier, you need to use chi square, right? That's what, that's what, that's what we've done earlier. If your data are on an interval scale, right, and if you're interested in the relation between the two of them, right, and uh, you're going to use, and if um, uh, there are an interval scale, then you're going to use, as you did earlier in Joshua's presentation, or during Joshua's presentation, a correlation. Right? So depending on all these complexities, that's all the tests you can, all the tests you can use. If you're interested, I'd be happy to uh, to, to to give you that. That, that, that slide that tells you what tests need to be used, uh, what tests need to be used when. All right. Good. So again, different types of scales. The types of scale have as a consequence for the kind of test one is doing. The descriptive statistics are important uh, to have get a sense of the data. Uh, what I want to do now quickly is uh, look at some of the most important tests. To some extent, I'm going to uh, repeat what uh, Josh said, but put it uh, in a slightly different perspective. So let me just start. Um, so here we're just talking about classical statistics, so the kind of statistics that was invented by E.H. Fisher, uh, you know, the great man, uh, uh, about 80 years ago, 90 years ago now. And uh, that's basically what almost everybody does. But there's a move toward Bayesian statistics. We haven't talked at all about Bayesian statistics. If you're interested, that's a wonderful book. You know, I, I don't have any... Uh, uh, any, sto any uh, stock in the uh, in, uh, academic press, so I'm not trying to sell it for you to make money. Uh, but it's really a very nice book. If you want to learn a very different way of doing statistics, I highly recommend uh, Krushka's, uh, Krushka's book about Bayesian statistics. Here, everything we've been talking about today is classical statistics. Right? Um, now, most of the statistics we've been looking at today are parametric statistics. Right, so, uh, ex except for chi square, so parametric statistics are statistics that assume uh, it's an assumption that the populations from which the data are drawn are normal. Right. So, to compute the p-value, you just make an assumption that uh, populations are normal, that the variable that you're looking at are normally distributed. Right. Uh, when um, so t-test, ANOVAs, correlations are all part of parametric statistics. It's, an, it's just an assumption, so it's important to test it, right? Um, so tests typically make some assumptions about the population from which the samples are drawn, and these assumptions are needed to derive, to compute the p-values, right? If the assumptions are not met, often, well, the, the, the reported p-values may be misleading, right? and they may be actually wildly misleading in some situations, right? So you, you're computing your p-value, it says 0 0.01, good news, but if the assumptions were not met, so genuine, your true p-value may be 0.4, instead of, instead of 0.01, maybe 0.4, right? So when the assumptions are not met, sometimes the p-values you're reporting may be misleading. Also, on the other hand, most tests which are common are robust, uh, meaning that even when the violations are violated, 
the p-value which we are computing are reasonable approximation. It's going to be only true if your sample size is really large. It's, it's large. So that's another reason why you really want a large sample size. You know, so Simin talked about it this morning, why it's really important to have a large sample size for, for the power of a test and to have very precise measurement. Another reason why you want a large sample size when you do an experiment is uh, when your sample size is large, even if the assumptions are, which are the basis of the statistical test, even if the assumptions are not met, it doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so um, as when sample size are large, <coughs> assumptions can be violated with very little cost. So again, when you do an experiment, I think it's really reasonable to really to have a large sample size, 80, 90 people, 100 subjects. And uh, also, in addition, you want to check whether the assumptions are, are violated, right? So that's really an important. Before running any test, um, I think you just want to spend a little bit of time checking whether the assumptions which are built into the test you are using are violated. If they're not violated, and if your sample size is not large, then you should not use the test. You should use another test, often a non-parametric test, one of these counterparts of the test you were using. But it's really, it's, 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 it's really important, and not, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know exactly how often psychologists check the assumption, I suppose very often, but that's not reported in papers. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit unclear whether experimental philosophers, at least for a long time, have checked the assumptions of, 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 of the test they were, they were using. Um, effect sizes, we've talked a little bit about these. Are, they're, uh, 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 you know, they just tell you how large your, your effect is, issue of confidence interval, which I mentioned earlier, which is true. Um, now, it's not, I mean, on my view, effect sizes don't always matter. It kind of depends on the research question you're interested in. So in some times, what you're really interested in is just a causal claim. Variable x causes variable y, as stands in causal relation to variable y. And you don't exactly care about the size of the effect. In that case, maybe reporting the effect size does not make much sense. In other part, however, in the large part of psychology, uh, effect sizes do matter a whole lot. Effect sizes do matter a whole lot because you really want to have a sense of um, uh, the change in a dependent variable when a change is made to any dependent variable. Right. So it's, it's to some extent depend on, on your research question. Uh, but often they do matter, and when they do matter, it just makes no sense not to report them. You need you, you ought to report them. All right, let's go quickly through some of the tests. Uh, I'm going to repeat some of the things that uh, Josh has said. Correlation, well, the point of a correlation is to find out whether two variables, x and y, are linearly associated. Right? So correlations tell you when you change one variable, is there a linear change <coughs> in another variable? The so null hypothesis is that there is no change, that, that there, there is no correlation between the, the, two, the two variables. The so statistical hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, is that there is some kind of association between the variables. We've seen all that, that R, uh, which is your correlation coefficient, uh, is between minus one and, and, uh, and, uh, and one. If the probability of, that, so that's a statistic, right? It's a function of the data. Is the probability of, a stat, of a R of a given value or a larger one conditional on the null is below 0 0.05, you reject the null hypothesis, and you conclude that in your population, there is a real association between the two variables. Again, so what you have is data. You look at the data to look at how the variables are related in your data. Your conclusion, of course, is not about your data. You don't care about the 50 data points you have, 100. The conclusion is about the populations from which the variables are drawn. Right? So you draw the conclusions that the variables are associated in the populations from which the variables are drawn. And I'll skip that. And R, then I think that it's, it's, it's in, it's, it is its own measure of effect size. You know, so when you compute a correlation, the R value that you report is also uh, an effect size. Right? So uh, zero is a non-effect size, there's no effect. One is maximum correlation. That's a classic paper that you, if you really want, if you really are going to do experiments, you need to have that paper on your desktop. It's a called a power primer. And, and not only on your desktop, it's nice to open it sometimes. Uh, that's a table, really, that you care about. Uh, it's worth reading the paper, it's like seven pages. Uh, it's called a power primer. And just, that's in a sense what was cited this morning implicitly by Simin. It gives you uh, 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 the main indexes, indices of, of effect size. And it tells you what's a small effect size, what's a medium effect size, what's a large effect size. Right? So it's just, just a convention, which actually are dominating the field uh, right now.
Now, as I said, every test has assumption, and it's important to be really sensitive to the assumptions. I won't go through all the assumptions of all the tests, but I just want to give you an example. When you do a correlation, right, you're just assuming you're not testing it, that the variables are linearly correlated. Right? You know, it's, it's, a pure, it's, 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 a, it's just an assumption. Right? Your test you know, does not test whether they're linearly associated. Um, and what you could have is a nonlinear relation between some data, but you could detect, you know, you, you could compute a, a correlation that would give you a significant, a significant result. So the so first thing you need to do is, well, maybe look at the data, right? In some cases, that's not, not an obvious case, but in some cases, the data will be clearly not linearly associated. Uh, in that case, that would be a mistake to compute a correlation between the two between the two variables because you would be making a claim that the, the variables at the population level are linearly related, while uh, while they actually would not. They could be, for example, related uh, in a quadratic manner. Again, uh, there are formal ways to do that, but maybe one just one thing you can do is just plot the data. And SPSS does it for you, and just look at whether the data looks like to be. The data look like to be linearly associated or not. Another assumption for um, correlation is that the score of each variable are normally distributed for the levels of the other variable. Right? So you've got two variables. Right? Each variable has specific levels. Right? Uh, and what one assumption is that the data, the, the scores of each variable, right? the variable itself, for example, the age and the variable uh, salary, right? Uh, how much money you're making, right? Positively associated, um, the older you are, uh, at least, let's say, between 20 and, uh, and uh, 60. Uh, the older you are, the more money you make, I think it's probably true. Uh, what, to compute the correlation, you need to be assuming that at every level of, let's say, age, the uh, distribution of the salary is normally distributed, right? That's an assumption. Again, uh, the good news is that if you have more than 26 subjects, or 27 subjects, uh, you can ignore that concern. Right? But still, uh, the key point here, you're making, there's an assumption which is built in the test. If your sample size is really small, or if you don't have a large sample size enough, <coughs> when the assumption is violated, the p-value you're going to be reporting is going to be really misleading. So in some cases, you need to check. Another alternative is often to just have a large sample size. And then many of the assumptions doesn't really matter if they're not met. And again, something we should read. Yeah, Does that sample size vary depending on what you're analyzing? Or well, sample like size is just the number of subjects in your study. Uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, so no, no matter what phenomenon you're you're uh, exploring. Uh, oh, you, 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 mean, you mean, is that true that for every phenomenon, if the sample size is above 27, then yes, that's true. It's, it's a purely mathematical fact. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's, it's just not depend on that. And something which is really important is outliers have a huge impact on correlations. Right? So uh, here, for example, uh, you know, if you have Northern Island here, and what is it? It's a uh, expenditure of tobacco as a function, so how much you spend on, on, on booze as a function of how much you spend on cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, Northern Ireland here is obviously an outlier, right? I mean, that's key. Now, if you, if you get rid of Northern Ireland, you have a very nice correlation. The more, the more money you spend on booze, the more money you spend on, on, on alcohol, or vice versa. If you add Northern Ireland, then Odds are, I don't know, I mean, computer the correlation, but odds are that the correlation just disappear entirely, right? Um, again, it strikes me the right thing to do here is actually to compute the correlation without Northern Ireland. And to just say it, Northern Ireland seems to be an exception to this linear relation. I mean, what we have here is a really strong linear relation between these two variables. If you, if you leave Northern Ireland in your, in your data set, you don't have this, this linear relation. When you look at the data, it's fairly obvious uh, what you want to do. Just report the analysis without Northern Ireland and explain that you have excluded Northern Ireland. Right? So the generalization just does not hold of all countries, but hold of a subset of, 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 of countries. Now, there's a question about why then it does not hold of Northern Ireland. Um, you know, I guess you know, if you're a psychologist or sociologist, you have to say something about Northern Ireland. Uh, 
But so yeah, so if you pay, if you're doing regression, outli uh, outliers are really quite important. They can also drive to have a, here in that case, a drive to have a non-significant correlation. It's you know, and the, on the other hand, it's not so bad because in the worst case, you're not publishing the paper. What's more problematic is when outliers drive you to get a significant correlation. So there's like no correlation. And suddenly there's this weird point here which slightly moves your correlation towards significance and you can't publish your paper. Everything hands on this data point. It's very common things. I mean, if you run correlation, often you're really concerned that, particularly if your p-value is not very high, that if you get rid of one of the two extreme points, the correlation just is going to go away. Uh, there are formal ways, I believe, to deal with that. You can uh, uh, test the robustness of your correlation analysis. Um, yeah. So it's more advanced statistics. But again, the key point here, be aware of, of our outliers. And I think the key lesson here is that, so you know, what tests you need to use depends on what kind of data you've been <coughs> collecting, how you've been collecting the data, the repeated lessons in data and so on and so forth. But then every test has assumptions. Some of the assumptions can be validated if the sample size is large. But you really want to be cautious. And I think the case of outlier and the case of regression just really tell you why you really want to be cautious. Okay, very, very quickly, key test, you know, we, so we, we, you run some key tests. The idea is to find out whether a population mean differs from a pre-specified value. So if you got only one sample drawn from one population, you may want to say whether that population differs from a specific value. Or when you've got two populations, two samples, you may want to test whether or not these means are equal. Or whether two population means differ from, from one another. And to do that, you compute what is known as a T statistic. So what you have here, is a T statistic for only one sample. Um, and just to give you a sense, so SPSS nicely has computed the T statistic for you. Right? And uh, most people just never even ask what the T statistic really is and don't really care very much, provided SPSS gives them the right value. But it's not very hard to see what T, what T is really doing for you. Right? So T is a statistic, it's a function of the data. And what it does is it measures how far in standard deviation, the mean you've obtained, right, so you, let's suppose you've got only one sample, right, and you want to know on a like a scale from one to seven, and you want to know whether the mean is different from four, not in your sample, that's very easy to do, you just compute the sample and see whether it's different from four, but in the population from which the samples are drawn. Right. Right. So what you do then, what T is going to tell you is how far the mean of the sample is from what the mean of the sampling distribution would be if we were sampling from a distribution whose mean is equal to four. Right. Uh, so you know, we just assume that we're sampling from the population which is described as a null hypothesis. Right. So its mean is equal to four. So the mean of the sampling distribution of the means, which we saw earlier, you may remember, so that's is going to be equal to four. So t tells the t value right, tells you how far the mean you've obtained is from the mean of the sampling distribution. Right? And of course, the further away you are from the mean of the sampling distribution of the means, right, the more unlikely it is that you would get this data or more extreme one if the null hypothesis were true. Right? So the larger t. Right, so, you know, so, so t again measures the distance between the mean of the sampling distribution and the mean you've obtained. Of course, the larger t, right, the more likely it is, the, the more unlikely it is that you would have obtained this data or more extreme one, conditional on the null hypothesis. So there's really no mystery about t, right? It just tells you, okay, I do an experiment. I've got a mean. If the null hypothesis were true. On average, I would, the most common mean would be blah, 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 right? And the mean I've obtained is that far away from the mean that would be the most common mean if the null hypothesis were true, and you can compute this probability. There's nothing really mysterious here, and that just formula that computes, that, that express, expresses this idea. So you can use a one sample t test when you've got a single sample, right? You want to know whether a population mean is different from a specific value, right? Okay. You can use t-tests with the related samples, right? Uh, it's a pre-post test, or the same participants in condition one and condition two, right? Um, and also, you can use t-tests with independent samples, right? Um, which is what uh, uh, Josh had you do earlier. <laughs>
D, Cohen's D, which we've seen a few times, is uh, the measure of the effect size for, 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 for the test. Right? And then Cohen D just measure the difference when you've got two means, just measure the difference between the two means, which you, got norm which you normalize by the variance or the standard deviation in that case of, the, of, of, of your data. Right? So basically it says, oh, the two means are half a standard deviation away from one another, or a whole standard deviation away from one another. Right? So D is, in a sense, just a, a measure of the distance between the two means of your data. Right? Um, again, what you have is a bunch of assumptions, which are, again, really important to check. Right? I think it would be a mistake to just go around running t-test without being, a, at minimum, careful about the assumptions of, of your t-test. Um, one assumption is that the population variances are equal, right? So you've got two samples that drawn from two populations. An assumption of the test is that the populations from which they're drawn are dispersed to the same amount, right? Again, the good news is that um, if the two sample sizes are roughly equal, and if there are limits to the, and if the variance of the two samples, of the two samples are not too different from one another, you can you can go about doing your business as usual, right? So there are conditions that need to be met, but under some conditions, you can just go about doing your business. But what's really important is you need to, have a, you need to know that kind of things, right? You need to know when you can apply, when you can apply to test and when you can't. Uh, another assumption is um, the different variable needs to be normally distributed, right? But again, if the sample size is large, then you're fine. Then you can go, you can go about doing, doing your t-test. All right, the third kind of test I wanted to mention um, is uh, analysis of variance, right? which is an, in some way an extension of, of the t-test, and it's completely quite, so the mass is quite different. But at the same point, you want to show whether some means are different from one another. So you've got three populations. You want to know whether there is one, whether there is at least one difference between the means of n populations. And if you've got three populations, you want to know whether the three means are equal to one another. Or also, what you want to know is whether a difference between two population means depends on other variables. So you want to know, OK, I've got two population here. They, they differ to that extent. Right? Does that difference depend on, on another variable? So that's something you often want to know. Um, and I'll I skip the, uh, the F statistics. So the one way I know that, just tell you, well, you've got a variable. It has more than two levels. It has maybe three, four, five levels. You can't use a t-test, which is used for only two, or compared to two groups. So one way ANOVA is going to be used in that kind of conditions. If it's significant, right, if you do one way ANOVA, and if you have a significant result, you know that at least two of the means you're comparing are different from one another. But you don't know which one. At least so what you need to do is post hoc test to find out which of the means you are comparing are different from one another. Right? So if you've, got three, um, if you've got three means, mean one, mean two, and mean, mean three, mean one and mean two are identical to one another, mean two and mean three are different from one another, <coughs> when you do your one-way ANOVA, you will get a significant result here. But of course, it does not tell you which of these three means is different from one another. You need to do a post hoc test by using t test. You compare m1 and m2, m2 and m3, and m1 and m3. So you do a post hoc test to find out which of these means is different from one another. Um, factorial ANOVA is when you have two variables, or more than two variables. Right? We talked a bit about that this morning. And that's what you really want to know is whether um, Let me just see what I want to tell you. OK, so let's suppose So what you, what you want to know here, so you've got two variables, variable, a variable which is measured here, a variable which is measured there. And what you want to know is whether this variable has an, has an impact. Right? It's called a first man effect. Whether this variable has an impact, a second man effect. And so you want to know whether the effect of that variable depends on these variables. That's an interaction, which Virginia mentioned this morning, right? So what you have here is no interaction in all these cases. It should be fairly obvious why. Right? So here, B, the main effect of B, right? moving from B1 to B2, changes your values. There's no main effect of A, 
right? So it's changing from A1 to A2 to A3 does not change your value. Here, there's no interaction, obviously. Here, there's a main effect of A and a main effect of B, right? There's no interaction. Here, there's also a main effect of A and a main effect of B, so there's no interaction. And here, what you have is a many different ways you can have an interaction. Right? So here, um, um, the effect of A depends on the value of B. So A has no effect when B is equal to B2, but has an effect when B is equal to B1. Right? Here, what you have is a cross, what is known as a crossover interaction. Right? The value of the effect of A is inversed when B is equal to B1 and when B is equal to B2. Right? So moving from A1 to A3 leads to an increase in B, in, in B when B is equal to B2 and a decrease in B when B is equal to B2. And here's another form of, of interaction. Now, if you're doing a, an ANOVA, a factor analysis of variance, um, and you get a significant interaction, you need to be really cautious in the way you're going to interpret the main effect. Right? And uh, the reason being that you can have a, that kind of situation here, right, where uh, uh, A is going to be significant, right, when you just look at the main effect, but now the issue is that it's kind of misleading to say that A is, is, A, is, that A is no, that A has an, an influence on, on people's behavior because A will have an influence only when B is going to be equal to B1, not, not when B is going to be equal to B2. So when you're running, a, when you're competing in ANOVA, you've got two more variables, you will see how they interact. When you have significant interaction, you need, just need to be really cautious about the way you're interpreting your, 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 your main effect. And particularly, if you're in that kind of situation, don't conclude that A has an, A has an impact. A in itself doesn't have an impact. A has an impact only when B is equal to B1. Right? Um, okay, and again, there's plenty of assumptions that you need to pay attention to. All right. And I will skip chi square because I would chi square because I'd like to talk about, about something else to conclude, and we've already seen chi square. What I'd like to talk about is two things, but what I'm really interested in is the second one, because that's something I found really, really quite recently, and I'm really quite excited by it. Uh, so, so that's the issue of the problem of multiple testing, right, which was um, mentioned by uh, Virginia alluded to when you were at the end of the talk uh, this morning. Um, now, you know, when you're running many, 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 many tests, right, well, you're increasing the likelihood, the probability that at least one of the tests in the whole family of tests is going to be a false positive. Right? And you can actually compute this probability, right? Probability, so it's called the family-wise error rate, which is you know, the probability that among the set of tests you're doing, at least one of them is a false positive. Right? And here's the probability. Just to give you a sense of, so M here is the number of tests, alpha is a significant level. Just to give you a sense of that, prob of that probability, so if you do, 10 tests, the probability that um, <coughs> at least one of them is a false positive is equal to 0.4. Right? If you do 20 tests, it's about equal to 0.6. It's really quite a lot. Particularly then if you've got selection of what you're going to publish, uh, and then you know, you're going to publish a lot of false positive if you do a lot of experiments and report only one of them. Now, there's a bunch of techniques to control for, for that. Now, they're controversial, so that's a very lively area of uh, applied statistics. Um, but all the idea, so for multiple comparison techniques, the idea is to reduce the family-wise error rate, right, to make sure that you won't make too much of, of, of false positive. And the most common one is a bond family procedure. So if you want to explore the philosophy and you're running a bunch of different tests because maybe you're collecting a bunch of different variables, what you need to do? Just, if you're running M test, take your significance level alpha, divide it by M. So if you're running 10 tests, Instead of deciding that your significance level is going to be 0.05, yeah. your significance level is going to be 0.005. Uh, no. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, so you're just dividing your usual significance level by the uh, number of tests you're doing. It's a very conservative way of going. It's, it's controversial. It's a very, it has costs. Right? You're decreasing the power of your test by doing that. But you know, uh, if you really care about not making any false positives, in some domain you really care about not making false positives, like if you're working on gender and philosophical intuition, maybe you don't want to make, to make, to make claims about <laughs> gender. Uh, I think it's good to, uh, uh, um, um, uh, it would be really good to divide the alpha by, by M. 
which is actually what uh, Thomson, Namias, and uh, what's the first author's name? And the, Edelberg. Yeah, Edelberg. What they do actually in their papers so is they have a conservative usable and fairly procedure. Now, what I really wanted to talk about, because that relates to what Virginia was talking about this morning, uh, is uh, aggregating across stimuli. stimuli. Uh, so Virginia this morning said, well, look, uh, you don't want to just use one vignette. You want to use many vignettes. Because you don't, if you use one vignette, like if you like a girl machine, for example, and, and you do part of your career based on the Gödel case, you know, you publish like, tons of papers, and you get tons of paper annoyed at you, but you, you know, there's only one vignette that you've been using again and again and again, and you don't really know whether your result would generalize beyond the specific case you're using. You don't really know whether it's due to the formulation of the case. After all, it could be the way the case is, is formulated that's explaining the effect you're getting. So the solution, which psychologists, experimental philosophers increasingly, the psychologists have been for doing for like ages, like Josh Green is a great example, Fabi Kirschman was a great example, is take a bunch of vignettes. They all have the same formal structure, but their content varies from one another. Right? So for example, if you're interested in uh, the trolley case, instead of just having, of having the trolley case, have a bunch of cases where an individual need uh, to choose between one and five people. Right? And uh, varies, the, varies, the, varies the content. And then you're just aggregating across all these, these vignettes, and you're comparing uh, 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 you're comparing the, uh, you're just looking at the effect once you've aggregated across all these units. Now that was what Virginia recommended, and that's what psychologists have been doing for a very long time. It's a very good idea, otherwise you're not sure that your results are driven by the content of your scenario. Now there's a caveat to that claim, and uh, you know I'd, I'd be curious to know how that bears on some of the research published by more psychologists. If you do that, you, and I'm sure Virginia knows because she does uh, you know, psycholinguistics, uh, if you do that, you are considerably inflating your uh, <coughs> false positive. Right? So the false positive you're reporting, you know, so you're, you, you know, you're just aggregating your, uh, uh, through 10 vignettes, and you just say, oh, with p-value 0.05, people are uh, less likely to, to kill someone to save five people in a footbridge-like case compared to uh, a bystander-like case. Right? You, know, you, you, com you compare 10, 10 cases that are footbridge-like and 10 cases which are bystander cases. Mm -hmm. Now, in a very nice paper, uh, it has actually like a mathematical counterpart to this, to this work, uh, Jude and colleagues have shown that if you do that and if you don't control for the error introduced by using many stimuli, many vignettes, you get massively inflated error rate. Right? And just to give you the data, so that's a simulation, right? It's uh, so, so, so simulated what you will get. And just focus at, at the, I don't want to spend too much time explaining what this is about, but just focus at the top, top scale. If you've got 10, 10 stimuli, like 10 vignettes, for example, 10 uh, trolley-like cases, and 10 bystander-like cases, or five trolley-like cases and five bystander cases, and if you get 90 subjects, your true false positive rate is 0.6. Right. So even if there's no, even if there's no effect size in your population, 60 times out of 100, 6 times out of 10, you're going to report there is an effect. Right. Uh, if you increase the number of stimulus, see so it gets a little bit better, but does that get great? Even with 90 stimuli, the proportion of uh, 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 30 times out of 100, when there is no effect, you're going to report. So it's not, you know, it's a usual, it's a usual way of thinking, is there's no effect, is there's no gene effect, it's another hypothesis is true, but at most five times out of 100, with the psychologist reports a significant result. Right? That's the point of, of uh, having a significant level. Now, what these data tell you is that when you're aggregating <coughs> across stimuli, Right? as is done throughout psychology, I mean, especially so moral psychology, and the more what you have is massively inflated, uh, massively inflated uh, uh, error rate. So the conclusion here is now there are ways to control for that, and the paper actually gives you most, quite sophisticated way to uh, analyze your data that you should follow. 
when you're using many stimuli or many vignettes. But the conclusion is, if you're using many stimuli, if you're using many vignettes, like Green, like Cashman, you should not just aggregate across them and then run your stats. Because if you do that, the error rates are just gigantic. They're actually enormous. What you need to do is to analyze them in a specific manner, right? which is described in the paper I just mentioned earlier. But it's really a little bit advanced for, 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 for you know, describing the, the, mass, the mass here. Uh, but I think it's really quite important because I've heard talks recently, people saying, look, we expert philosophers are making huge progress. We're just imitating uh, uh, moral psychologists by taking many vignettes that we control for the specific content. But then it turns out if you do that, you massively increase the probability of making a false positive. Uh, so it's good to do that. Just we need to do it in the proper way. Then we need to have the right statistics to help us do that. All right, so as what I was just saying, if you want to do that, you need to... Uh, follow the method which has been recommended by uh, 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 Jude and Jude Enkin. It's fairly advanced, uh, fairly advanced uh, statistics. Okay, conclusion, I want just to conclude on that and repeat a bunch of, of things we've been talking about today, which is all the possible mistakes we, you could make. Well, first you could use the wrong scale, right? So you, you're interested in knowing versus not knowing, and then you could have a five-point scale with knowing at one hand and not knowing at the other hand, and you kind of wonder what's in the middle. Uh, then you could have the right scale, but you could use a wrong test for your scale. Very common. So I've seen a paper recently, I won't give names, someone collected uh, data which are ordinal data, but ran a t-test on, 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 on this data, right? Uh, ordinal data, you should use a chi-square. Uh, uh, and you know, so you know, wrong, uh, uh, when you have a scale, you need to use the right kind of test. It's not uncommon to see that people, but case for the first time, psychologists don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> You want to use the right test for your sampling method, between subject or within subject. You really want to check your assumptions of, of your data, particularly if your sample size is small. Right? If your sample size is large and if the variances are similar in your two samples, usually you're on safe grounds. But if your sample size is not very large or if you have massive differences in the variances across your two samples, you really need to be cautious about your assumptions. Then, misunderstanding the p-value, very common mistake in statistics. People just draw conclusion about the probability of the null hypothesis, the probability of the alternative hypothesis. You can't do that. That's not what the p-value tell you. Do an experiment with a low power. That's a terrible, uh, uh, terrible thing. I mean, Simi was just really right about that. Misinterpret a non-significant <coughs> result. We haven't talked very much about that, but you do an experiment, you don't get a significant result. Usually, you're not, you know, not getting a significant result is, does not mean that there's no effect. Right? It just means you, you have failed to show there is a significant effect. That said, and I've argued that in the, in the, in the paper published in Philosophy of Science, that said, uh, there's ways to draw inferences about the null hypothesis. So if your power is high, the same rationale that allow you to reject the null hypothesis allow you to actually accept the null hypothesis. Right? But to do that, you need a really large power. So again, you need a very large sample size. Or you can go Bayesian. Right? If, you, you know, if you care about showing that the null hypothesis is actually true, or you get evidence for the null hypothesis, Bayesian methods actually are one way to go about doing that. Um, you can, another mistake is to, to analyze many effects when interaction has been found without being cautious about doing it. Not controlling for repeated testing, right? You, you run 20 tests and you don't pay attention to that. You don't control for the use of multiple stimuli. That's the last point I was mentioning. If you have 10 vignettes, you aggregate across them. As a matter of fact, your uh, uh, false positive Rate, the upper bound of the false positive rate is going to be massively inflated. And you don't report effect sizes when they matter. That's also uh, another mistake. When effect sizes matter, when you want to make a claim about the difference between two groups, you need to report an effect size. All right. Thank you.